A few days later, I receive a message from the Hungarian leader Selassie, who invites me to... They may well turn out to be our units trying to fight their way back. I therefore order all pilots to make sure before attacking, flying at low altitude, that the troops they are attacking are in fact Soviet. We had fully loaded our ammunition while flying back from Hungary, but there is still no sign of our refueling vehicles. I glance at the fuel gauge. We only have fuel left for one short sortie. Twenty minutes after landing at Udifefeld, we are off on our first combat sortie in the area. Chesto Koa shows up in the distance. I survey the roads heading east, on which, judging by reports, Russian tanks are moving. We are flying at low altitude over the city. But what's going on up there? There's a tank moving down the main street, followed by a second and a third. They look like T-34s, but they can't be. They're probably tanks from the 16th and 17th Armoured Divisions. I make another circle. There is no mistake. It is without a doubt a T-34 with infantry seated on top of the armour. Ivans, these can't be the captured tanks we sometimes use, because in that case their crews would fire rocket launches into the air or stretch swastika flags on their hulls. My last doubts dissipate when I see the infantry opening fire on us. I give the order to attack. We shouldn't drop bombs on the city. There's always the chance that there will be civilians below who were taken by surprise and unable to evacuate the city. High voltage transmission wires, tall houses with antennas, and other obstacles make it extremely difficult for anti-tank planes to attack from low altitude. Some of the T-34s are circling the city blocks, so it's easy to lose sight of them while diving. I shoot three tanks in the center of the city. These tanks had to come from somewhere. We fly east, along the railroad and highway. Just a few kilometers outside the city, the next group of tanks rolls ahead of a column of trucks with infantry, ammunition, and anti-aircraft guns. Here, in the open, we feel in our element and give the tanks an unpleasant surprise. Dusk comes and we return to base. Eight tanks are on fire, we are out of ammunition. We never took our task lightly but we may have been inclined to treat tank hunting as a form of sport. Now, however, I feel that the whole thing has ceased to be a game. If I ever saw another tank after I ran out of ammunition, I would ram it with my airplane. I am seized with rage at the thought of this step horde, rolling through the heart of Europe. Will anyone be able to rid Europe of them again? Today they have powerful allies supplying them with materials and opening a second front. Will poetic justice one day bring terrible retribution? We fly from dawn to dusk regardless of casualties, disregarding the enemy and bad weather. We are on a crusade. We keep silent between missions and in the evenings. Everyone does his duty with clenched teeth, ready to give his life if necessary. Seers and soldiers realize that the life-affirming flow unites them in a spirit of camaraderie, regardless of rank and class. And so it has always been with us. Egite. On one of these days, the Reach Marshal summons me urgently to Karen Hall. I'm absolutely forbidden to fly. It's an order from the Fuhrer. I'm going crazy with excitement. To miss a whole day of flying and come to Berlin to learn about this situation. It's unbearable. I just won't do it. At this point, I feel that I am only responsible to myself. I call Berlin between flights with the intention of asking the Reich Marshal to grant me a postponement until this crisis is over. Hoping for a concession from the Führer, I must be allowed to continue flying. I cannot just look on from the sidelines. The Reich Mismotchen is not in attendance. I'm trying to contact the chief of the general staff. They're all in a meeting with the Führer and can't be reached. The matter is very urgent. I intend to pull all the levers before deliberately disobeying orders. As a last resort, I call. The telephonist at the Führer's headquarters does not understand me and probably concludes that I want to connect with this or that general. When I repeat that I want to speak to the Führer personally, he asks me your rank. Corporal, I reply. Someone on the other end of the line laughs, realizing the joke and connects me. Oberst of Enlov picks up the phone. I know what you want, but I beg you not to anger the Führer. Didn't the Rex Marshal say anything to you? I reply that that's why I'm calling and describe the gravity of the current situation. 
but it doesn't work. He advises me to personally come to Berlin and talk to the Reichsmarschall. He believes that there is a new assignment for me. I am so furious that I cannot speak and hang up the phone. There is a sepulchral silence in the room. Everyone knows that when I am furious, it is best to give me time to cool down in silence. Tomorrow we have to fly to Klein IT. I know this neighborhood well. Our tank acquaintance Count Straitwitz lies nearby. The best way to forget about my frustrations is to fly to Berlin and see the Reichsmarschall. He receives me at the Karin Harley. I am struck by his irritability and lack of good-heartedness. We talk during a short walk through the woods. He immediately opens fire with guns of the largest caliber. I spoke to the Fuhrer about you last week, and this is what he sees. When Rudel was here, I didn't have the heart to tell him that he should stop flying. I just couldn't tell him that. But then, what are you? The commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe to do? You can... I can't. I am glad to see Rudel, but I do not want to meet with him again until he gives in to my wishes. I'm quoting the Fuhrer's words and I'm telling you so directly. I also do not wish to discuss the matter any further. I know ahead of time all your arguments and objections. This is a stunning blow. I return to Klein Eicher. During the flight, my mind is preoccupied with the events of the last few hours. I know now that I must ignore the order. I feel that it is my duty to Germany, to my country, to throw all my experience and my personal efforts on the scale. Otherwise, I will appear to myself as a traitor. I must continue to fly no matter what the consequences. In my absence, the regiment makes a combat sortie. Lieutenant Weisbach, who did not participate in the flights because I needed an operational officer, goes on a tank hunt with Lieutenant Lieutenant Wig, a first-class marksman and Knight's Cross recipient. They do not return from the battle. For us, it is an irreparable loss of two invaluable battle comrades. These days we have to give everything we have, we can't spare ourselves. These operations keep me more stressed than ever, because I remember all the time that I did not fulfill the orders of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. If anything happens to me, I will be denied military honours and disgraced. The thought worries me, but I can't do anything about it. I am in the air from morning until late afternoon. All my officers know that if anyone asks me, I'm not on a combat sortie, but just stepped off somewhere. Individual accounts of tanks destroyed must always be listed in the daily reports sent to Luftwaffe headquarters each evening with the name of the pilot. Since the no-flying order remains in style, the figure of tanks destroyed by me is no longer recorded on my personal account, but goes to the account of the whole regiment. Until now, the figures of tanks destroyed were only recorded in this category if two pilots attacked the same target. Then, in order to avoid double counting, the figure was recorded under the heading it is impossible to specify the name of the pilot accurately. The victory is attributed to the entire unit. Later, we often had disputes with the command, which pointed out that before we could always specify the name of the pilot. Why suddenly so many tanks appeared in the column joint account? At first, we avoided the questions by saying that nowadays, when any one person notices a tank, we all dive on it at the same time, as everyone wants to strike. One day, during my sortie, a spy in the person of a Luftwaffe officer shows up to investigate and pulls everything out of my operations officer, promising that he won't tell anyone anything. In addition, one general catches me by surprise immediately after the flight at the airfield at Grotko, to which we have just relocated. He doesn't believe my assurances that it was only a short test flight, but that, he says, doesn't matter because he didn't see anything. Nevertheless, I soon discover that the truth has reached the high command. One day, shortly after the general's visit, I am mentioned in a military communique as having destroyed eleven tanks, and at the same time I am summoned by telephone to Karin Harley. I fly there and meet a very cold reception. The first words of the Reichsmarschall. The Führer knows that you continue to fly. I believe he learned about it from yesterday's communique. He has asked me to warn you to stop flying immediately and permanently. You must not force him to resort to disciplinary action for disobeying an order. He has no idea that this is the behavior of a man who has been awarded Germany's highest award for bravery. 
I suppose I may not add my own comments. I listened to him in silence. After briefly questioning me about the situation in Silesia, he lets me go and I return to the unit the same day. It is clear to me that I must keep flying if I am to maintain my composure during such a difficult time for my country. I must keep flying. Eddie T. We are hunting for tanks in the industrial area of Upper Silesia, where it is easier for the enemy to camouflage and harder for us to spot. Our attacking U-87s swirl between the chimneys of the industrial towns of Upper Silesia. In Kiefernstadl we meet our artillery, which we have not seen before, and help them to eliminate the numerically superior forces of the Soviets and their T-34s. Gradually a new front is created on the Oda, to create a new front out of literally nothing. Only Field Marshal Skorner could do that. We often see him now, when he visits our base to discuss with me, the current situation possible operations. To particular value to him are the results of our intelligence. At this time it is reported that squadron leader Lau is missing with his gunner. He was hit by anti-aircraft guns, made an emergency landing near Gross Wartenberg and captured by the Russians. After his attempt to land away from the Soviet troops failed, he had to land right in their midst. A front is gradually being established along the Oder River. I receive a telephone order to immediately relocate the regiment to the airfield Markish Schweidland in Pomerania and the 2nd Squadron in Frankfurt. The situation here has become more dangerous than in Silesia. Dense snow is falling, which prevents us from flying in close formation. So we take off in threes and head for Markish Friedland via Frankfurt. Some of our planes land at intermediate airfields at Sagan and Sorau. The weather is disgusting. At Frankfurt they are already waiting for me to land. I must without delay call the old base at Grotkull. When I'm connected, I learn that shortly after my departure, Field Marshal Scorner came to see me and made a big fuss. Knocking his fist on the table, he asked who gave me the order to relocate. Lieutenant Niemann, my operations officer, told him that the order came from Luftwaffe headquarters. Luftwaffe headquarters. It's all a screen. I want to know who ordered Rudel to fly away. Call him to Frankfurt and order him to wait there. I'll raise the matter with the Fuhrer himself. I insist that he stay here. Am I to hold the front with one infantry with rifles? I'll find out about all this on the phone. If I want to get to Markish Friedland before dark, I can't waste any more time. I call the Führer's headquarters to ask whether I should continue my flight or return to Silesia. In the first case, Field Marshal Skorner is to release my men held by him at Grotkal so that I will have a full complement of men and equipment when I arrive at the new location. My regiment is definitely transferred to the north since the situation in this sector, of which Rishifer SS Himmler has been appointed commander, is much more serious. I land at Markish Friedland with the first few planes in a heavy snowstorm, and in total darkness, the rest of the regiment should arrive tomorrow. The second squadron will stay in Frankfurt and will make combat sorties from there. After we find a place to sleep, I call Himmler in Ordensburg Kressensi to report my arrival in the sector. He is glad that I am here and very pleased that I won the duel with Field Marshal Scorner. He asks me what I am going to do now. The time is 11pm, so I reply I am going to bed, since I need to get up as early as possible tomorrow to get a general idea of the situation. But Himmler thinks otherwise. And I can't sleep, he says. I tell him that he doesn't need to fly tomorrow morning, and that when people fly non-stop, sleep is indispensable. After much idle chatter, he informs me that he is sending a car to pick me up to see me as soon as possible. Since I'm low on fuel and ammunition anyway, the information about the new sector that his commander can give me may at least alleviate me of some organisational problems. On the way to Ordenburg we get stuck in snowdrifts. By the time I get there, it's two in the morning. The first person I see is his chief of staff with whom we have a long discussion about the situation and general matters. I am particularly curious to hear from him how Hitler is embarking on his new task. Seeing that he lacks the necessary training and experience, his chief of staff is an army officer and not a member of the SS. 
He tells me that it is a great pleasure to work with Himmler because he is not at all a self-righteous man and is not looking for an opportunity to show his power. He does not think he knows better than the experts of his staff. Readily agrees with their suggestions and then uses all his authority to translate the solution into reality. And that's why everything goes smoothly. Only one thing will strike you. You will always have the feeling that Himmler never says what he really thinks. A few minutes later, I discuss the situation and my task with Himmler. I immediately notice his concern. The Soviets have almost bypassed Schneidemul and are tearing into eastern Pomerania towards the Oder, partly along the Nearsi Valley and also north and south of it. There are very few units in this neighborhood that could be called combat ready. A battle group is being formed in the vicinity of Markish Friedland to hold back the enemy forces that have broken through and to prevent their impending movement toward the Oder. No one can yet predict the extent to which our troops in the neighborhood of Posen Grodens will be able to fight their way back. In any case, they will not be able to recover quickly. Intelligence leaves much to be desired and it is therefore impossible to get a complete picture of their position. This, therefore, will be one of our first tasks, besides attacking the enemy at all known points he has already reached, especially his mechanized and armored forces. I find out the needs for bombs, fuel and ammunition. If they are not satisfied in a few days, I will not be able to carry out combat missions. Himmler promises me, in his own interest, that my requests will be met first. I explain to him what possibilities I see in the use of my compound, basing my viewpoint on the picture he has painted for me. I leave Ordensburg at 4.30 a.m., knowing that in two hours I will be flying over the sector. To you, the Stukas fly all day long without interruption. Our airplanes are decorated with the emblem of the German Order of Chivalry, because now, as six centuries ago, we are involved in a battle with the East. Very cold weather is setting in. The snow cover on the airfield reaches a height of five centimeters. When we take off, this snow dust clogs the gun mechanisms on our anti-tank planes and freezes as soon as we are in the air. After one or two shells are fired, the guns jam. I can't stand it. Here below me, Russian armored columns are advancing on Germany and when we go into attack, at times overcoming very strong air defenses, what happens? The guns are silent. Some pilots are already thinking of crashing into the tanks out of sheer desperation. We go in again and again, but it's hopeless. It happens to you us at Charnico, at Felena, in many other places. The T-34s are tearing westward. Sometimes it only takes one shot to blow up a tank, but often it is not enough. The most valuable days are lost before I finally get enough men to continually clear the runway of snow. The sheer number of tanks makes the hair on my head move. We fly to all sides of the world. If the daylight hours were three times as long, it was still too little. Interaction with our fighter squadron is above reproach. They respond to every reconnaissance report we make. Enemy forward units at so-and-so or so-and-so point. In the joint operation east of Dacia Krona, and in the woods south of Schlopp, we were able to inflict substantial losses on the Soviets. When tanks find themselves in a village, they usually drive right into the houses and try to take cover there. After that, they can only be spotted by a long pole sticking out of the middle of the house, which is nothing more than a tank cannon. A breach forms in the wall of the house, and since it is unlikely that there are still Germans living in it, we come in from behind and shoot the engine. No other methods of attack work. The tanks catch fire and explode along with the ruins of the houses. If any of the crew remains alive, they sometimes try to drive the burning tank into a new shelter. But in this case, the outcome of the fight is already decided. Because at that moment you can strike at any vulnerable part of the tank. I never drop bombs on villages, even if it is justified from a military point of view because I shudder at the mere thought of hitting the German inhabitants who are already defenseless against the terror of the Russians. It is a terrible thing to fly and fight over our own homes, especially when you see masses of men and military equipment rushing into your country like a flood. We are now playing the role of a dam, a small obstacle, but unable to stem the tide. Germany, all of Europe is now at stake in this devil's game. Priceless forces are bleeding, 
The last bastion of peace is crumbling under the onslaught of Red Asia. In the evening we are more exhausted by this thought than by the incessant flying during the day. The refusal to accept this doom and the certainty that it can't happen keeps us moving. I would hate to blame myself for not doing my best and preventing the frightening, threatening spectre of defeat. I know that every decent young German thinks as I do. South of our sector, the situation looks very grim. Frankfurt on Odier is under threat, so at night we receive orders to move into the first in Waldy area, which is closer to the critical sector. A few hours later we fly into the operational area of Frankfurt Kustrin. The wedges of the Soviet offensive have reached the odour on the outskirts of Frankfurt. Farther north, Kustrin is surrounded and the enemy, wasting no time, seizes a bridgehead at Goritz Rightwin on the west bank of the frozen river. One day, like the Prussian cavalry general Zeiten 300 years ago, we take part in a battle east of Frankfurt on the site of a historic battle. Here a small German force is surrounded by Soviet tanks. We attack them and those tanks that didn't catch fire are trying to get away across open ground. We go in to attack them again and again. Our comrades on the ground jump for joy, throw their rifles and helmets into the air and without caring about cover pursue the retreating Russians. Our fire puts every last tank out of action. A joyous mood reigns among all who witnessed our success. After all the tanks have been destroyed or captured, I prepare a container and write a congratulatory message to our comrades on behalf of the regiment and on my own behalf. I circle at a very low altitude and drop the container with the note and a bar of chocolate right at their feet. The sight of their happy, grateful faces strengthens us in anticipation of difficult operations and inspires us to renew our persistent efforts to ease the struggles of our comrades in arms. Unfortunately, the first days of February are very cold. The odour has frozen over in many places so badly that the Russians can wade across the river. They often put planks on the ice and I see trucks driving over them. The ice does not seem to me strong enough to support the weight of the tanks. Since the front on the odour is not yet established and there are many gaps in its line with no German soldiers to resist the advance, the Soviets managed to capture a few bridgeheads, such as at right Wien. Our tank troops, which were brought into the battle too late, face here strong enemy defences on the west bank, backed up by heavy artillery. The river crossings have been protected by heavy anti-aircraft fire since day one. Ivan is well informed of our presence in this sector. Every day I am ordered to destroy the crossings to delay the offensive and buy time for our reinforcements and combat equipment to approach. I inform you that it is almost useless at the moment, because you can cross the Oder almost anywhere. The bombs break through the ice, leaving relatively small holes, and that's all we can accomplish. I attack only recognisable targets on both sides of the river or vehicles crossing it, but not so-called bridges, which strictly speaking do not exist at all. What looks like a bridge on an aerial photograph usually turns out to be infantry tracks and vehicle ruts and planks laid on ice. If we bombard these tracks, the Ivan just crosses over the ice away from them. This becomes clear to me on the first day because I have flown over them countless times, and besides, these crossings are nothing new to me. I know them from the Don, Donets, Dniester, and other Russian rivers. Therefore, disregarding orders, I concentrate my attacks on the genuine targets on both sides of the rear. Tanks, vehicles, and artillery. One day a general sent from Berlin shows up and tells me that new bridges always appear in photographs taken from reconnaissance planes. But, he says, you have not reported that these bridges are not destroyed. You have to keep attacking them. By and large, I explain to him, they're not bridges at all, and as I see his face turn into a question mark, an idea occurs to me. I tell him that I was just about to take to the air and invite him to fly with me, and I promise him that I will provide practical proof of it. He hesitates for a moment. Then, seeing the curious looks of my young officers, who heard my proposal with some glee, he agrees. I give the unit orders to attack the bridgehead, and myself approach the target at extremely low altitude and fly from Schwedt to Franfjord. In some places we encounter respectable anti-aircraft fire, and the general soon recognises that these bridges are in fact tracks. He has seen enough. 
After landing, he is very pleased that he was able to see for himself and makes a report accordingly. We are relieved of our daily duty to attack these bridges. One evening, which Minister Spear brings me a new assignment from the Fuhrer. I am to draw up a plan for its fulfilment, he tells me briefly. The Fuhrer is planning attacks on the hydroelectric dams that supply power to the war industry in the Urals. He expects that the production of enemy armaments and especially tanks will be halted for a year. This year will give us a chance to take advantage of the respite. You are to organize this operation, but in no case should you fly yourself, the Fuhrer repeated this several times. I drew the minister's attention to the fact that there were more suitable candidates for the task, namely, from the Long Range Air Command, who were familiar with such things as astronomical navigation, etc. Much better than I, who had received training in dive bombing and therefore had a completely different knowledge and experience. Moreover, if I am to set a task for the crews and remain in a normal condition afterwards, I must get permission to fly myself. The Fuhrer wants you to be the one in charge of this operation, Spear Objects. I ask a few crucial technical questions relating to the type of aircraft and bombs with which this operation is to be carried out. If it is to be done as quickly as possible, only the Heinkel 177 can be seriously considered, although it is not entirely clear whether it will be suitable for this purpose. From my point of view, the only bomb for such a purpose is something like a torpedo, but it has yet to be tested in action. I refuse his suggestion to use ton bombs. I am sure that no success can be achieved with them. I show the minister photographs taken in the northern sector of the Eastern Front, when I dropped two ton bombs on the concrete supports of a bridge over the Neva and it did not collapse. This problem, therefore, must be solved, as must the question of my participation in this mission. These are my conditions, if the fur insists that I take on this task. He already knows my objections concerning the fact that my experience belongs to a completely different field. I receive a dossier with photographs of the factories and study them with interest. I see that a large part of them is underground, and they are practically invulnerable from the air. The photographs, which were taken during the war, show the dam itself, the hydroelectric plant and some factory buildings. How are these photographs taken? I think back to my time in the Crimea and put two and two together. When we were stationed at Sarabais and kept ourselves in shape by weight, lifting and throwing discs after sorties, a plane painted black would often land at the airfield and very mysterious passengers would get off of it. One day a crew member told me in confidence what was going on. This plane brought Russian priests from the freedom-loving states of the Caucasus who had volunteered to perform important missions for the German command, dressed in cassocks and with their beards fluttering through the air. They each carried a small bag on their chests with either a camera or explosives, depending on their assignment. These priests saw the German victory as the only chance to regain their independence, and with it, freedom for their religion. They were fanatical enemies of the Bolshevik world, and therefore our allies, being with white beards and noble facial features, as if carved from wood. From the depths of Russia they delivered pictures, spent months on the road, and returned after completing their assignment. If one of them disappeared, he most likely gave his life for freedom or as a result of a failed parachute jump, caught while on assignment or on his way back behind the front lines. I was impressed by my interlocutor's account of how these holy men jumped into the night without hesitation, strengthened by faith in their great mission. At that time we were fighting in the Caucasus, and they were dropped by parachute over mountain valleys where their relatives lived with the help of whom they intended to organize resistance and commit acts of sabotage. All this came to my mind as I pondered where the photographs of these factories had come from. After a few general remarks on the general course of the war, in which Speer expressed his complete confidence in the Fuhrer, he left early in the morning, promising to send me new details concerning the Ural plans. But it never came to that because the events of February 9 made my participation in this operation impossible. No. Thus, the task of developing the plan was entrusted to someone else. But then, in the fever of events of the end of the war, this plan lost its practical significance. 
Early in the morning of February 9, the telephone call is heard in the headquarters. From Frankfurt reported that last night the Russians have made a crossing of the Oder near the village of Libus, north of the city, and with the support of tanks hold a bridgehead on the west bank of the river. The situation is more than critical. There are no infantry nearby to attack them, and there is no way to get heavy artillery there that could stop the enemy. Thus, there is nothing to keep the Soviet tanks from starting a march on the capital, or at least cutting the Frankfurt-Berlin railroad and highway, which are vital to supplying the front on the Oder. We are flying there to find out how fair this report is. From afar, I can already see the pontoon bridge and long before we approach it, anti-aircraft guns open fire on us. The Russians have prepared something of an appetizer for us. One of my squadrons is attacking a bridge laid right across the ice. We don't have much hope of accomplishing anything substantial. As we know from experience, the Ivans have so much construction material that they can rebuild the bridge almost instantly. I fly low overhead with the anti-tank planes and look for tanks on the west bank of the river. I can make out their tracks, but I can't see the steel monsters themselves. Or were those the tracks of artillery tractors? I go even lower to be absolutely sure and see the tanks well camouflaged in the folds of the river valley on the northern edge of the village of Libus. There are probably 12 or 15 of them here. Something hits the wing, a hit from a light anti-aircraft gun. I keep low, anti-aircraft guns are firing from everywhere. The river crossing is defended by about six or eight anti-aircraft batteries. The anti-aircraft gunners seem to have been playing these games for a long time and have gained a lot of experience in fighting Stukars. They do not use tracers. We do not see the threads with strung red beads stretching toward us. We realize that they opened fire only when the plane suddenly shuddered from the impact. As soon as we gain altitude, they immediately stop firing and our bombers do not see who they are attacking. Only if you fly very low over the target, you can see flames bursting out of the gun barrel like torch fire. I'm wondering what to do. There is no way to approach the target stealthily as the flat river valley does not allow for such tactics. There are no tall buildings or trees. Sober reflection leads me to conclude that experience and tactical skills can help, even if all the basic rules that come from them are broken. The answer, a determined attack and hope for luck. If I'd always been this adventurous, I could have gone to my grave dozens of times already. But there are no our troops and we are 80 kilometers from the capital of the Rake at a dangerously short distance, if the enemy tanks are rushing to it. There is no more time for prolonged reflection. You'll have to rely on luck this time, I say to myself. Go. I order the other pilots to maintain altitude. There are several newcomers among them, and so far they can't be expected to do much damage to the enemy in this defence. On the contrary, we are likely to suffer unnecessarily high casualties ourselves. When I get below, and as soon as flashes of anti-aircraft guns become visible, they should concentrate the fire of their guns on the anti-aircraft guns. There is always a chance that this will confuse the IVANs and affect their accuracy. There are a few is tanks standing here. The rest are T-30T-4s. After four tanks catch fire and I run out of ammunition, we fly back. I talk about my observations and emphasize the fact that I attacked, only taking into account the proximity of Berlin, otherwise such an attack would be unjustified. Had we held the front further east, I would have waited for a more favorable situation, or at least for the moment when the tanks would come out of the zone of protection of their anti-aircraft installations concentrated around the bridge. After two sorties, I changed planes because mine had sustained damage from anti-aircraft fire. The fourth time I fly back, and they're already burning all twelve tanks. I'm flying on a glide over an IS tank, which is spewing smoke, but still does not catch fire. Every time before going into the attack, I rise to 800 meters, because anti-aircraft guns at this height is difficult to hit me. From there I dive steeply, desperately throwing the car from side to side. When I'm nowhere near the tank, I level the car at the moment of the shot, and then drift sideways over the tank itself, following the same evasive tactics, to the point where I can gain altitude again. 
out of range of the anti-aircraft guns. I would of course need to approach the target more slowly when my airplane has better control, but that would be suicidal. Only through extensive experience and somnambulistic self-confidence am I able to level the machine for a split second and hit the tank at its most vulnerable points. Of course, such attacks could never be carried out by my colleagues for the simple reason that they do not have enough experience. The blood pulses furiously in my head. I know I'm playing cat and mouse with fate, but this is must be set on fire. Once again to an altitude of 800 meters and down to the 60-ton Leviathan. It still won't catch fire. I'm choking with rage. It must burn and it will. The red light on the panel board is blinking. And then there's this. One of the guns has a jammed breech. The other has only one shell left in it. I'm climbing up again. Isn't it crazy to risk everything for one shot? For once my Ju-87 takes much longer than usual to gain altitude at 800 meters, as I now begin to weigh the pros and cons. One of my eyes says if that 13th tank still hasn't caught fire, don't imagine you can get your way with one shell. Fly home and replenish your ammunition, you can always find it later. To this my other self replies with fervor, perhaps there is only one shell missing to prevent this tank from rolling freely across Germany. Roll on Germany. That sounds like melodrama. A lot more Russian tanks will roll across Germany if you fail badly at your job, and you're about to fail. Don't be under any illusions. Only a madman would stoop so low for one shot. It's pure madness. Now you're going to say you couldn't do anything just because it was the 13th tank. What nonsense. All that superstition. You only have one shell left, so drop this indecision and get to work. And here I am already going down from a height of 800 meters. Concentrate on the flight, throw the plane from side to side. Here again the guns are spitting fire at me. Now I'm leveling off. Fire, the tank bursts into flames. With glee in my heart, I fly over the burning tank. I go up in a spiral, the engine crackles and suddenly my leg is pierced by a red-hot steel blade. My eyes go black, my breath catches, but I must keep flying lying. I mustn't lose consciousness. Clench your teeth. You must overcome your weakness. Spasms of pain roll throughout my body. Ernest, my leg is blown off. No, if it came off, you couldn't talk. Our left wing is on fire. You need to get down. We've been hit by two 40 anti-aircraft shells. A frightening darkness envelops my eyes. I can't see anything else. Tell me where to land. Then get me out faster so I don't get burned alive. I can't see anything else, piloting, obeying one instinct. I vaguely recall starting each attack from south to north and then turning left. Thus I must be flying west toward home. It goes on like this for several minutes. I don't understand why the wing still hasn't fallen off yet. I'm actually flying northwest, almost parallel to the Russian front. On your own. Shouts Gaderman over the intercom and I feel myself slowly sinking into some kind of fog. A pleasant oblivion. Handle on yourself. Shouts Gaderman again. What was that? Trees or telephone wires? I feel nothing and pull the handle towards me only because that's what Gaderman is shouting. If only this burning pain in my leg would stop and this flight. If only I could let myself sink into this strange grey world and into the distance that beckons me. Pull. Once again, I automatically pull on the handle. But now for a moment, Gaderman really wakes me up. I suddenly realize I have to do something. What's down there? It's bad? A rut. But I have to go down, or else this dangerous apathy will come over me again, and I lose control of my body. I push down on the left pedal and scream in agony. But I've been hit in the right leg, haven't I? I lift the nose of the airplane up. Just so we don't parachute, the airplane is on fire. There's a thud and the plane glides for a few more moments. Now I can rest, slide into the grey distance. Wonderful. Crazy pain jerks me back to consciousness. Is someone dragging me? The ground here is so uneven. It's all over. I'm finally in the arms of silence. Exercy. I come to everything around me is white. Attentive faces. A pungent odour. 
I'm lying on an operating table. Suddenly panic grips. Where is my leg? It's gone. Zerchen nods. Down the mountain on brand new skis, diving, athletics, pole vaulting. What does it all mean to me now? How many friends have been hurt more seriously? Remember, one in the hospital in Dienapropetrovs, his face and both arms were torn off by a mine explosion. The loss of a leg, of an arm, of a head, none of that matters. If only the victim could have saved the motherland from mortal danger, it's not a catastrophe. The only catastrophe is that I won't be able to fly for weeks, and this in such a critical situation. These thoughts rush through my brain for a second and the surgeon says to me softly, there was nothing I could do. Other than a few scraps of flesh and fibres, there was nothing there, so the leg had to be amputated. If there was nothing else there, I think to myself with grim humour, what was he able to amputate? Well, surely it's normal for him, commonplace. But why is the other leg in a cast? He asks in amazement. Since last November, where am I? In the main field hospital of the SS troops in Siloo. Oh, in Zioloi. That's seven kilometers from the front line. So I was obviously flying northwest, not west. You were brought here by the SS, and one of our medical officers performed the operation. You have another wounded man on your conscience, he adds with a smile. Did I bite the surgeon? Well, you didn't get to that, he says, shaking his head. No, you didn't bite him. But Lieutenant Corral tried to land on the storch near where you made your emergency landing. But it must have been too difficult. His plane parachuted, and now his head is bandaged. Good old Corral. It seems that even though I was flying unconscious, I had a few guardian angels. Meanwhile, the Reich Marshal has sent his personal doctor with instructions to take me immediately to the hospital, which is housed in a bomb-proof bunker on the grounds of Zoo, Berlin Zoo. But the surgeon who operated on me doesn't want to hear about it because I've lost too much blood. Tomorrow everything will be all right. The Rix Marshal's doctor tells me that Gori immediately reported the incident to the Fuhrer. Hitler, he said, was very pleased that I got off relatively lightly. Of course, if the chickens want to be smarter than the hen, he said, as I was relayed, among other things. I was relieved that he didn't mention that he had forbidden me to fly, I suppose in view of the desperate fighting and general situation of the last few weeks. My participation in the fighting was taken for granted. NTT. The next day I was transferred to the Sioux bunker which also serves as a platform for the heaviest anti-aircraft guns involved in the capital's defence against raids against the civilian population. On the second day, a phone appears on the nightstand by my bed. I have to contact my unit about combat operations, general situation, etc. I know I won't be in bed for long and I don't want to lose my post, so I'm concerned about staying informed and involved in unit affairs even if only by phone. The doctors and nurses who have shown me touching care are, at least in this regard, not very happy with their new patient. They keep saying something about rest. Almost every day I am visited by colleagues from the unit or other friends, some of them just people who introduce themselves as my friends to make their way to my room. When they are pretty girls, they open their eyes wide and raise their eyebrows questioningly when they see my wife sitting by the bedside. They have already started talking to me about a prosthesis, although they don't know the extent of my recovery yet. I am impatient and want to get up as soon as possible. A little while later I am visited by a prosthesis maker. I ask him to make me a temporary prosthesis with which I can fly, even though the stump has not yet healed. Several first-class firms refuse on the grounds that it is too early. One craftsman accepts the order, but only as an experiment. He goes at it so vigorously that I get dizzy. He applies the plaster all the way up to the groin without lubricating the surface or adjusting the protective cap. After allowing the plaster to dry, he advises succinctly. Think of something pleasant. At the same moment, he pulls with all his might on the cast to which my hair is stuck and rips it out by the roots. The pain makes me feel like the end of the world. This guy is clearly in the wrong profession. He should be shoeing horses. 
Meanwhile, my third squadron and regimental headquarters have moved to Gorlitz, the same town where I went to school. My parents' home is quite close by. Right now the Russians are pushing their way into the village, Soviet tanks rolling over the places where my childhood pa I could go crazy just thinking about it. My family, like millions of others, have long since become refugees, unable to save anything but their lives. I lie there, doomed to inaction. What have I done to deserve this? I don't have to think about it. S flowers and all sorts of gifts that are brought to my room every day are proof of the love of the people for their soldiers. In addition to the Reese Marshal, I am visited twice by the Minister of Propaganda Goebbels, with whom I was not previously acquainted. He is interested, in my opinion, on the strategic situation in the East. The front on the Oder, I tell him. Our last chance to delay the Soviets together with it will fall and the capital. But he compares Berlin to Leningrad. He points out that this city has not fallen because all its inhabitants have turned every house into a fortress, and what the people of Leningrad were able to do, the people of Berlin will be able to do as well. His idea is to achieve the highest degree of organization in the defense of every home by installing radio transmitters in every building. He is convinced that his Berliners would prefer death to the prospect of falling victim to the Red Hordes. Just how serious he was would later prove his own end. From the military point of view, I see it differently. I replied, once the battle for Berlin begins after the fall of the front on the Oder, I believe it will be absolutely impossible to hold the city. I would like to remind you that it is impossible to compare the two cities. Leningrad had the advantage of being protected on the west by the Gulf of Finland and on the east by Lake Ladoga. To the north of it, there was only one weak Finnish front. The only chance to capture it was an attack from the south. But from this side, Leningrad was strongly fortified and its defenders were able to take advantage of an excellent system of pre-prepared positions. In addition, the city was never completely cut off from the supply line. Cargo boats could cross Lake Ladoga in summer, and in winter the Russians had laid a railroad line across the ice and were able to supply the city from the north. My arguments can't change his mind. After two weeks I can already get up for a short time and enjoy the fresh air. During air raids, I am on the roof of the concrete Sioux Tower where the anti-aircraft guns are mounted, and I can see from below what is probably so unpleasant to those in the air. I am not bored. Fridolin brings me papers that require my signature. Sometimes he is accompanied by my colleagues. Field Marshal Green, Skorzeny or Hanna Riachi drop in to chat with me for an hour. Some event is always going on. I am only tormented by the fact that I am apart from them. When I got to the zoo bunker, I vowed that I would be back on my feet in six weeks at the latest and flying. The doctors know that their injunctions are useless and can only make me angry. At the beginning of March, I go out for a walk in the fresh air for the first time, on crutches. During my convalescence, I am invited to my home by one of the nurses, and here I am, the guest of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. A real soldier rarely makes a good diplomat, and this meeting with von Ribbentrop is quite intriguing. It is an opportunity for conversations that shed light on the other side of a war, fought without the use of arms. He wants to know my opinion of the forces opposing each other on the Eastern Front and of our military potential at the moment. I tell him that we on the front hope he is doing something through diplomatic channels to loosen the dead grip with which both sides are clutching. Can't we demonstrate to the Western powers that Bolshevism is their greatest enemy, and that after the final victory over Germany it will pose the same threat to them as to us, and that they alone cannot get rid of it? He takes my remarks as a mild personal reproach. No doubt I am only repeating what he has already heard many times from others. He immediately explains to me that he has already made a number of attempts which have ended in failure, because each time a new retreat on one or the other section of the front, soon after he had begun negotiations, encouraged the enemy to continue the war and leave the negotiating table. He mentions these instances and says reproachfully, that the treaties he concluded before the war, among others with England and Russia, were no small achievement, if not a triumph. But no one remembers them any more. 
Today people see only the negative aspects for which he is not responsible. Naturally, even now the negotiations are still going on. But with the situation as it is, the chances of the success he still hopes for look problematic. This glimpse behind the diplomatic scenes satisfies my curiosity, and I am not eager to learn anything more. XET In mid-March, in the spring sunshine I take my first walk around the zoo, accompanied by my nurse, and during my first excursion a small accident happens to me. We, like many others, are fascinated by the caged monkeys. I am taken by a particularly large monkey sitting lazily with a completely indifferent look on a bitch, from which its long tail hangs. Of course I can't help but do something I shouldn't, and stick my crutch through the bars with the intention of tickling its tail. No sooner do I touch the tail than the monkey suddenly grabs my crutches, and tries with all his might to drag me into the cage. I hop up on one foot to the bars themselves, but of course the beast can't drag me through them. Edelgard's sister grabs hold of me and together we pull the crutches toward me. Man versus AP, her paws begin to slide over the smooth surface of the crutch, and reach the rubber cap at the very end that keeps the crutches from digging deeply into the ground or slipping when walking. The rubber cap piques her curiosity. The monkey sniffs it, swipes it off the crutch and swallows it with a wide grin. At the same moment I am able to pull the crutch out of the cage and at least partially win this fight. A few seconds later, the howl of sirens warning of an air raid is heard. The fast walking on the sandy paths of Sue makes me sweat, because without rubber caps my crutches sink deeply into the sand. Everyone around me is hurrying and hustling. I can hardly use their help and continue to waddle, limping badly. It's slow work. We barely make it to the bunker before the first bombs start falling. Easter is coming. I want to get back to the unit before it comes. My regiment is now based near Grossenheim in Saxony. The first squadron has flown again from Hungary to the Vienna area and is still on the southeastern front. Gliedemann is at Brunswick the whole time I am away, so that he can attend to the treatment of the sick in the meantime. I call him to tell him that I have ordered a U87 to pick me up at Tempelhof at the end of the week and intend to return to the unit. Since Gaderman had spoken to my attending physician shortly before, he cannot fully believe this. Besides, he's sick himself. I will not meet him again during the war on those last operations which are now about to begin. The place of my gunner is taken by Lieutenant Niemann, who has no lack of combat experience and who wears the Knight's Cross. In obeying orders to report to the Fuhr before leaving, I bid him farewell in the bunker. He speaks again and again of being pleased with my relatively smooth recovery. He doesn't forbid me to fly, probably because the thought of me flying more combat missions just doesn't cross his mind. So here I am, sitting in my airplane again, flying to my battle buddies for the first time in six weeks. It's Easter Eve and I'm happy. Shortly before takeoff, Fridolin calls and asks me to fly directly to the Sudetes. He is going to move the unit to Kummer MC near Nimes. At first I feel very strange in the airplane, but soon I am back in my element. The controls are difficult because I can only use one pedal. I can't push the right pedal because my prosthesis isn't ready yet, so I use my left foot to lift up the left pedal. This movement lowers the right pedal and I get the desired result. My stump is in a cast and stretched out onto the dashboard with no risk of hitting anything. An hour and a half later I land at the new airfield at Kummer. The regiment arrived here an hour ahead of me. Our airfield is situated in a magnificent location, between two spurs of the Sudeten Mountains, and is surrounded by forests on all sides. Nearby is the picturesque cast Lake Kummer. Until the cantonment problem is solved, we sleep in a beer. In the Sudetes there is still an atmosphere of complete peace and tranquility. The enemy is behind the mountains and this front is held by troops under Field Marshal Scorner, so this unperturbed calm is not so absurd. So do we have an o'clock? We hear the high voices of a children's choir singing Gott Grustich. The local school, led by the hostess, greets us with a serenade. This singing is something new to us veterans. It touches strings that now, at this stage of the war, we will soon have to forget. We listen spellbound. 
each of us immersed in our own thoughts. We feel that these children believe in our ability to repel the impending danger, with all its attendant horrors. At the end of their song, I thank them for the charming encounter and invite them to visit our airfield in the morning to see our birds. They show up the next day and I begin the procedure by taking off in my anti-tank plane and firing at a one-third square meter target. The kids stand in a semicircle and can imagine attacking an enemy tank. It's a good warm-up for me to try to hit with one foot. On the opposite slope of the Sadatine Mountains is still closed by fog, and since we can't make a combat sortie, I have some free time, so I take a Focke-Wulf 190D9 into the air and demonstrate aerial acrobatics at high and low altitude. This genius Hauptmann Kachner. My engineering officer has already redesigned the foot brakes, which are indispensable for this fast airplane so that they can be operated by hand. The moment I go to land, everyone is gesticulating furiously and pointing skyward. I look back and through gaps in the tattered clouds I see American Mustangs and Thunderbolts circling overhead. They are flying at an altitude of one and a half to two kilometers above a layer of fog. They didn't see me, or I wouldn't have been able to land safely. The Thunderbolts are carrying bombs and appear to be busy searching for a target, most likely our airfield, quickly, to the extent that word applies to a one-legged man in a cast. I jump to where the others are standing. They all need to take shelter somewhere immediately. I push the kids into the cellar, where at least they won't get hit by debris. Since the house we're using as headquarters is the only one on the airfield, it's sure to be a target for those guys circling up there. I go in last to quiet the kids, and that's when the first bombs fall, one close to the building, the explosion ripping out the window frames and blowing the roof off. Our air defense is too weak to repel this raid, but it proves to be enough to prevent attacks from low altitude. Fortunately, none of the children were hurt. I am very saddened that their innocent romantic thoughts of aviation have collided so cruelly with grim reality. Soon they calm down, the teacher lines up a small troop and races it towards the village. Nearman is pleased and beaming with happiness, because he was able to capture the entire attack on film. During this whole performance he stood in the gap, filming the falling bombs from the moment they separate from the planes to the explosions and the fountains of earth they raise into the air. Fresh weather reports from the Rolitz Butzen area also predict a gradual improvement in the weather so we're taking off. The Soviets have already bypassed Gorlitz and are tearing for Bautzen, which is surrounded with the garrison in hopes of reaching dread against these shock wedges, trying to cause the collapse of the front held by Field Marshal Skorner's troops. Constant counterattacks are launched. With our support, Bautzen is unblocked, and we manage to destroy a large number of vehicles and tanks. These sorties exhaust me. I have lost a lot of blood and apparently my inexhaustible endurance also has its limits. Our successes are shared by ground troops and fighters placed under my command and stationed at our airfield. At the beginning of April I am summoned to the Reich Chancellery. The Führer tells me that I must take command of all jet aircraft and with their help to clear the airspace over the new Army of General Wenk, which is now being formed in the Hamburg area. The first objective of this army will be to strike southward toward Graz in order to cut the supply lines of the Allied armies to the east. The success of this operation depends on the preliminary clearing of airspace over our own supply lines, otherwise the offensive is doomed to failure. The Führer is convinced of this and General Wenk, appointed to command this operation, agrees with him. I asked the Führer to relieve me of this task, because I believe that at this moment I am indispensable in the sector of Field Marshal Scorner. His army is involved in the heaviest defensive battle. I ask him to appoint to this post someone closer to him. I point out that my experience is limited to dive bombing and fighting tanks, and that I've always followed one principle. Never gave orders if I could not carry them out myself. With jets I cannot do this and consequently would feel awkward with group commanders and crews. I must always be able to show the way to my subordinates. But you don't have to fly yourself at all, only do the organizing. If anyone questions your bravery because you are on the ground, tell me and I will order that person hanged. 
Yes, a drastic measure, I think, but perhaps he only wants to dispel my doubts. We have an abundance of men with experience, but experience alone is not enough. I must entrust this to someone who can organize and carry out this operation in the most vigorous manner. The final decision is never reached that day. I fly back, but a few days later, the Reichs Marshal again summons me to his office. He gives me the order to fulfill this task. Meanwhile, the situation at the front has deteriorated to such an extent that Germany is threatened with addition into two parts, and carrying out the entire operation would hardly be possible. For this reason, and for other reasons already mentioned, I refuse, as the Reichsmarschall gives me to understand. This does not surprise him, since, since, since my firm decision not to take command of the Bomber Air Force, he knows exactly my attitude. Nevertheless, the main motive for my refusal is that I cannot accept responsibility for something of which I am not convinced of the feasibility. I soon become convinced of the gloomy colours in which the wretch marshal sees the situation. As we discuss the situation at the front, leaning over a table with maps spread out, he mutters to himself, I'm wondering when we'll have to set fire to this barn, referring to Karen Harley. He advises me to go to the Führer's headquarters and inform him personally of my refusal. Nevertheless, as I have received no orders so far, I fly immediately to my unit, where I am eagerly awaited. But this is not yet my last flight to Berlin. On April 19, a radiogram arrives. I am again summoned to the Reich Chancellery. To get to Berlin from Bohemia in an airplane without an escort is no longer so easy. In many places, the Russian and American fronts came very close to each other. There are many airplanes in the air, but there are no German airplanes among them. I arrive at the Reich Chancellery and am invited to go to the reception room of the Führer's bunker. There is an atmosphere of calm and confidence. Present are mostly army officers who are involved in current or planned combat operations. Outside, one can hear the heavy thumping of ton bombs being dropped by mosquitoes in the centre of the city. The commander-in-chief enters at almost 11 p.m. I had anticipated the subject of the conversation, this being the assignment discussed earlier. The Führer's hallmark is to go around and around and never speak directly about the matter, and this evening he begins with a half-hour lecture explaining the decisive importance of the development of technology in which we have always led the world, an advantage which we must now utilize to the utmost and thus turn the tide and achieve victory. He tells me that the whole world is afraid of German science and technology and shows me some intelligence reports describing the steps taken by the Allies to steal our technical achievements and our scientists. Listening to him, I am amazed every time by his memory for numbers and his specialized knowledge of technical things. At the same time, I have flown over 6,000 hours, and with my extensive practical experience, I know almost everything about the various types of airplanes he talks about, but there is nothing about which he cannot disseminate with inimitable simplicity and about which he has not made pertinent suggestions for modification. During the last three or four months, his physical condition has deteriorated. His eyes gleam brightly. Eberst von Belov tells me that Hitler has had virtually no sleep in the last eight weeks, one meeting succeeded by another. His hand is shaking. He's had it since the attempt on his life, July 20. During the long discussion that evening, I notice, in addition to his tendency to repeat the same thing which he has never done before, although his words are clearly thought out and full of determination. When the long preamble is over, the Führer comes to the main subject of which I have so often heard. He enumerates the reasons I was informed of a few days ago and concludes, I wish that this difficult task would have been undertaken by you, the only man who carries Germany's highest award for bravery. I refuse giving the same or similar arguments as last time, especially emphasizing the fact that the situation on the front has become even worse and that it is only a matter of time before the eastern and western fronts meet in the center of the Reich and after, that the two halves will have to operate separately. Only the northern cauldron can be considered in terms of the fulfillment of this plan, and it is here that all our jets will have to be concentrated. 
It turns out that the number of airworthy jets and bombers and fighters together, according to data to date, is 180 machines. At the front, we have long felt that the enemy has a numerical advantage of at least 20 to 1, taking into account that jet aircraft need a particularly long runway. We can begin by considering only a limited number of airfields in the northern cauldron. I point out that once we assemble our aircraft at these bases, enemy bombers will bomb them day and night, and in purely technical terms their operational effectiveness will be reduced to zero in a matter of days in which case it will not be possible to control the airspace over Wenk's army and disaster, will be inevitable, because the army will lose strategic mobility. I know from personal conversation with General Wenk that his army considers my guarantee of free airspace a reliable factor and takes it into account in all its calculations. This time I accept his responsibility and stubbornly refuse. Once again I am convinced Anyone whom Hitler considers to be selflessly serving the interests of the common cause has the right to freely express his point of view and can contribute to the Führer to reconsider his position. On the other hand, Hitler is losing confidence in those people who have continually disappointed and misled him. He does not agree with my theory of two cauldrons because he does not believe that it can predict how events will unfold further. He bases his opinion on the firm promise made to him by the sector commanders that they will not retreat from the positions they now hold along the Elbe, Oder, Nisi, and Sodden mountains. I make the remark that I trust the German soldier now showing particular bravery, because he is fighting on German soil. But if the Russians gather all their forces for a concentrated attack at one key point, they will be able to make a gap in our positions, and then the two fronts will join. I am reminded of the cases on the Eastern Front in past years, when the Russians threw tank after tank into the battle, and if three armoured divisions could not reach their objectives, they threw ten more, capturing positions on our depleted Russian front at the cost of huge losses in men and equipment. Nothing could stop them. The question, therefore, was whether or not they would exhaust their colossal manpower reserves before Germany was forced to her knees. This did not happen because the aid received from the West was so great. From a purely military point of view, every time we ceded our position in Russia and the Soviets suffered heavy losses, it was a defensive victory. But even though the enemy mocked these victories, we knew they were real victories. But this time a victorious retreat would be futile, as the Russians would find themselves only a few kilometers from the Western Front. The Western Allies had laid on themselves the unfortunate responsibility but perhaps for centuries to come, of weakening Germany, only to give additional strength to Russia. At the end of our conversation I say these words to the Führer. From my point of view, at this moment the war cannot be ended by victory on both fronts, but it is still possible to win on one front if we can conclude an armistice on the other. A tired smile slid across his face. It's easy for you to say that. Since 1943 I have endeavoured ceaselessly to make peace, but the Allies were unwilling to do so. From the very beginning of the war they demanded that I surrender unconditionally. My personal fate is naturally of no importance, but every man in his right mind sees that I cannot elect unconditional surrender for the German people. Negotiations are going on even now, but I have abandoned all hope of their successful conclusion. Consequently, we must do everything to overcome this crisis so that the weapon can still bring us victory. After exchanging views on the situation of Scorner's army, he tells me that he intends to wait a few days to see whether the general situation develops as he had foreseen, or whether my fears will prove justified. In the former case, he will summon me to Berlin to accept the appointment at last. At one o'clock in the morning, I leave the Führer's bunker. The first visitors are already waiting in the reception room for their turn to congratulate him on his birthday. Early in the morning I return to Kammer at low altitude to avoid the American Mustangs and Thunderbolts, which soon show themselves in the air and begin circling high above. Being in the air, wondering all the time did they notice me or not, an activity that keeps me more stressed than a combat sortie. No wonder Neumann and I are literally sweating from the exertion. We are glad when we finally land at our base. The slight decrease in pressure on our positions west of Golitz 
is due to our daytime operations, during which we were able to inflict heavy losses on the Russians. One evening after combat sorties I drive to Gorlitz, my hometown which has been caught up in the battle zone. Here I meet many friends from my youth. They are all busy with business. Not the least among their duties is participation in the Volkssturm. It's a strange return. We don't express the thoughts that are on everyone's mind. We each have our own load of problems, sorrow and bereavement. But at this moment we see only the threat from the east in front of us. Women are doing the work of men, digging tank traps and putting aside shovels just to feed hungry children. Old men have forgotten their age and work until sweat begins to drip from their brows. A grim determination is written on the faces of the girls. They know what the red hordes tearing west would have in store for them. The men are fighting to survive. If only the nations of the west could see with their own eyes what is happening in these momentous days and realize their significance, they would soon abandon their flippant attitude towards Bolshevism. Only the second squadron stands at Kummer. The regimental headquarters is housed at Nime School and some of us are living in the homes of the locals, the great majority of whom are Germans. They do their best to fulfill our every wish. Getting to the airfield is not always easy. Someone from the passengers of each car is always watching the sky to warn of enemy planes. Russian and American planes roar at low altitude all day long, often engaging each other. When we get in the air, we often find the Amos waiting to ambush us on one side and the Russians on the other. Our old U-87s crawl like snails compared to the enemy planes, and when we get close to the target, our nerves are already strained to the breaking point by the constant air battles. If we attack, the air is buzzing with swarms of enemies. If we go home, we again have to work our way through a ring of enemy planes before we can land. Our anti-aircraft guns covering the airfield have to literally clear a path for us to approach. American fighter planes do not attack us if they see us heading toward the front line and engage in aerial combat with the Ivans. We usually take off from Kummer Airfield early in the morning with a force of four or five anti-tank planes. We are accompanied by 12 or 14 FE-190 fighters, carrying bombs and at the same time playing the role of escort. The enemy is waiting for our appearance to pounce with a far superior force. Very rarely, if we have fuel reserves, we are able to conduct combined operations with all units under my command. But even then the enemy outnumbers us five to one. It's true, our daily bread is earned with sweat and tears. NT2 On April 25 I receive another radiogram from the Führer's headquarters, sent apparently in complete confusion. Practically nothing can be made out, but I guess that I am again summoned to Berlin. I call Luftwaffe headquarters and report that I have been summoned to Berlin and ask permission to fly there. The Commodore refuses to give his consent. According to the Army Bulletin, the fighting is going on around Tempelhof Airfield, and he does not know if there is any airfield left that has not yet been captured by the enemy. He say, If you are shot down over Russian-occupied territory, I will have my head cut off for letting you fly. He says he will try to contact Colonel Von Bilov by radio and request his exact message and exactly where I can land, if I can still do so. For several days I hear nothing about the matter, then at 11 p.m. on April 27, the Commodore calls me and tells me that he has finally succeeded in contacting Berlin, and that I am to fly there immediately on a He-100 and on the broad thoroughfare crossing Berlin, at the place where the Brandenburg Gate stands and the Victory Monument is located. I will be accompanied by near man. Taking off in a Heinkel one Lan one die does not seem easy, because we have no lights along the perimeter, nor any lighting at all. Besides, the airfield is small in size and on one side it is approached by rather high hills. In order to take off at all, we have to drain the fuel from the tanks to reduce the weight of the airplane. Naturally, this reduces the time we can be in the air. We take off at one o'clock in the morning. It's pitch black. We fly over the Sudeten mountains in a northwesterly direction into the area of ongoing battles. The area below us is lit up with fires, villages and towns are burning, the whole of Germany is in flames. 
We realize that we cannot prevent this horror, but it is better not to think about it. On the outskirts of Berlin, Soviet searchlights and anti-aircraft guns are already aimed at us. It is almost impossible to orient ourselves as the city is shrouded in thick smoke. In some places the fire burns so fiercely that it is blinding, and it is impossible to see any landmarks on the ground. I just have to stare into the darkness for a while before I can see anything again. But even after that I can't find the city thoroughfare I need. One conflagration after another, guns flashing, a nightmarish sight. My radio operator manages to contact the ground. We are ordered to wait. Fifteen minutes later, we receive a message from Colonel Belov that landing is impossible because the road is under heavy artillery fire and the Soviets have already captured Potsdamer Platz. My instructions are to fly to Richlin and from there call Berlin for further orders. My radio operator has the frequency of this radio station. We are in a hurry to call Richlin because our tanks are almost empty. Below us stretches an ocean of flames, which can only mean that the Russians have broken into the city and on the other side, in the near up in area and only a narrow corridor to the west is open for escape. To my request to turn on the lights, Reachlin responds with a refusal. They are afraid that they would immediately incur a night attack of enemy planes. I read to them in plain text the instructions for our landing, adding a few not particularly polite remarks from myself. I like all this less and less, because the fuel could run out at any moment. Suddenly the meager lights to our right come on and mark the outline of some airfield. We are landing. But where are we? It's Wittstock, 30 kilometers from Rechlin. Wittstock listened to our conversation with Rechlin and decided to turn on his lights. An hour later at 3 a.m., I arrive at Richlin, whose control room is equipped with radio communication. With its help, I manage to contact Berlin. Colonel von Belov tells me that it is no longer necessary for me to go to Berlin. Since Field Marshal Ritter von Grimm has been assigned to the place intended for me, with whom it was possible to contact in time. Moreover, he says that it is no longer possible to land in Berlin. I reply. In the morning, I will land on a Stuka on this main line. I think it can still be done on a lighter airplane. Besides, it seems important to me to get the Führer out of this dangerous place so that he does not lose control of the whole situation. And Belov asks me not to hang up while he makes inquiries. He returns to the phone and says, The Führer has made his final decision. He has decided that Berlin must be held to the last and therefore cannot leave the capital the situation in which looks critical. He is sure that if he leaves the city, the troops holding it will be convinced that he is abandoning Berlin to its fate and will conclude that any resistance is futile. Therefore, the Führer intends to remain in the city. You should not try to get into the city, but you should immediately return to Sudetenland to provide support for the army of Field Marshal Skorner, who is ordered to strike in the direction of Berlin. I ask von Belov what he thinks of the situation, because he tells me all this calmly and without emotion. Our situation does not seem too good, but an offensive by General Wenk or Skorner may yet save Berlin. I admire his equanimity. I know what to do and return to my unit to continue combat operations. The shocking news that the head of state and supreme commander of all the Reich's armed forces is dead has an overwhelming effect on the troops but the Red Hordes are ravaging our country, and so we must continue to fight. We will only lay down our arms when ordered to do so by our leaders. It is our duty under our oaths. It is our duty in view of the terrible doom that threatens us if we surrender unconditionally, as the enemy insists. It is our duty to the destiny that has placed us geographically in the heart of Europe and that we have followed for centuries. To be the bastion of Europe against the East, whether Europe understands or not the role which fate has assigned to us, whether it treats us with fatal indifference or with hostility, none of this changes our duty to it one iota. We are convinced that we will be able to hold our heads high when the history of our continent, and especially of the troubled times that lie ahead, is written. The eastern and western fronts are coming closer and closer together. 
we are finding it more and more difficult to carry out operations. One can only admire the discipline of my men. It has remained exactly the same as on the first day of the war. I'm proud of them. The harshest punishment for my officers, as it has always been, is when they are not allowed to fly with the others on a combat mission. I am having trouble with my stump. The mechanics have constructed for me an ingenious device similar to the devil's hoof that I fly with. It's attached under my knee, and every time I push on it, say when I need to push the right pedal, the lower part of the residual limb, which has just started to heal, is rubbed so that an ulcer forms on the skin. The wound reopens and starts bleeding heavily. Especially in aerial combat, when I have to turn sharply to the right, the stump constricts my movements, and sometimes after the flight my mechanic has to wipe up the blood that is splattered all over the cockpit. I am once again lucky in the first days of May. I am going to meet Field Marshal Scorner, but I want to look on the way to the Luftwaffe headquarters at her Munstadtl castle, about 75 kilometres away. I fly there on the Storch and see that the castle is surrounded by tall trees. In the centre is a park in which I can, I think, land. With me in the airplane is the faithful Fredolin. The landing goes safely, after a short stop to grab some maps. We take off again towards the tall trees, gaining altitude. Storch is slowly gaining speed. In order to facilitate the takeoff, I release the flaps just before the edge of the forest. But the airplane can't get above the tallest trees. I pull the handle toward me, but we don't have enough speed. Pulling back is useless. The nose of the airplane feels like it's getting heavy. I hear some kind of terrible cracking noise. I've now completely shattered my stump. If only it's not worse. Then suddenly everything goes quiet. Am I on the ground? No, I'm sitting in the cockpit with Fridolin next to me. We're stuck in a fork of branches at the very top of a huge tree, and we're swaying merrily back and forth. The whole tree is wobbly. The impact must have been too strong. I'm afraid the Storch will play another trick on us and flip upside down. Fridolin moves closer and asks anxiously what's going on. I tell him, don't move, or we and what's left of the Storch will crash down. The tail and pieces of wings have fallen off and are lying on the ground. I'm still holding the handle. The stump is intact. I didn't hit it against anything. Lucky me. We can't get down from the tree. It's very tall and has smooth bark. We wait and after a while the general appears on the scene. He heard the cracking and now sees us sitting in the tree. He is very pleased that we got off so lightly. Since there is no other way to get us down, he sends for the local fire department. They help us down a long extension ladder. The Russians have bypassed Dresden and are trying to cross the Erzegi Burge from the north to reach the protectorate borders and flank Shauna's army. The main Soviet forces are in the Freiburg area and southeast of it. During our last sortie, we see south of Diepoldiswold a long column of refugees being overtaken by Soviet tanks. They roll right through the human stream like asphalt rollers, crushing everything in their path. We immediately attack the tanks and destroy them, and the column continues south. Apparently the refugees are hoping to take refuge behind the Sudetine Mountains, where they think they will be safe. In the same area, we attack another column of Soviet tanks being protected by tornado-like anti-aircraft fire. I have just shot in his tank, and I'm climbing to 200 meters when, looking around, I notice a hail of debris behind me. They are falling from somewhere above. I ask Nierman which one of ours was just shot down. That seems to me the only explanation and Nierman thinks the same. He hurriedly counts the planes, but all are so no one has been shot down. I look back at the tank and see only a black spot. Could this tank have exploded with such force that its fragments were at such a high altitude? After the sortie, the crews who flew behind me confirmed that it was this tank that exploded and I saw its debris falling down. It probably had explosives in it, and its job was to clear the way for other tanks. On May 7, in order to discuss the plan just developed by the High Command, a meeting of Luftwaffe officers is held at the headquarters of Skorner's group. It is proposed that the entire Eastern Front be gradually withdrawn, sector by sector, until it runs parallel to the Western Front.
we feel that very sad decisions will soon be made. Will the West, even now, see its opportunity to move against the East, or will it never get a handle on the situation? On May 8, we fly out to search for enemy tanks in the vicinity of Oberleitensdorf. For the first time in the entire war, I cannot concentrate on the task. I am choked with an indescribable feeling of bitterness. I have not been able to destroy a single tank. They are still in the mountains, where we cannot get them. Absorbed in my thoughts, I turn to head home. We land and go to the control room. Fridolin isn't there, I'm told he's been called to group headquarters. Does that mean that, in one jerk, I shake off my depression? Nyaman, call the squadron at Reichensburg and tell them about the new attack. Arrange a place and time to meet the escort. I study the situation, map, what can be done here? Where has Fridolin disappeared to? I see a Storch landing off to the side. That's him. Should I rush out to meet him? No, better to wait here. It seems too hot for this time of year. The day before yesterday, two of my men were ambushed and shot by sex six in civilian clothes. Why is Fridolin gone so long? I hear the door open and someone enters. I force myself not to turn around. Someone is coughing muffled. Nearman is still on the phone. So it's not Fridolin. There's no way Nyaman can get through. That's funny. I'm noticing that today my brain is taking in every detail very acutely. All these silly little details that don't matter in the slightest. I turn around in a circle. The door opens, Fridolin. His face is drained, we exchange glances, and suddenly my throat is dry. Well, it's all I can squeeze out of me. It's over. Unconditional surrender. Fridolin's voice sounds no louder than a whisper. The end, I feel as if I'm falling into an abyss, and then in my hazy mind they all pass before my eyes. The battle friends I've lost, the millions of soldiers killed at sea, in the air, on the battlefield, it is the millions of victims who died in their homes all over Germany, the hordes from the east that are now flooding our country, Fridolin suddenly explodes. Give up that damn phone, near man. We'll decide for ourselves when we stop fighting, Neoman says. Someone laughs rudely. The laughter is too loud, not real. I should do something, say something, ask a question. Neoman inform the squadron at Reichenberg. They have a storch landing in an hour with important orders. Fridolin notices my helpless embarrassment and starts talking in an excited voice about the details. The retreat to the west is definitely cut off. The British and Americans have insisted on unconditional surrender on May 8, which is today. We are ordered to hand everything over to the Russians unconditionally by 11 p.m. But since Czechoslovakia is to be occupied by the Soviets, it is decided that all German troops should withdraw as quickly as possible to the west, so as not to fall into the hands of the Russians. The flying personnel should fly home or elsewhere. Fridolin. I interrupt him, build a regiment. I can't sit and listen to all this any longer. But won't it be worse if you do what you're going to do? What can you tell your men? They've never seen you desperate, but now you're in the very depths of... Fridolin interrupts my thoughts. The regiment is built. I'm out. My prosthesis does not allow me to walk properly. The sun shines in all its spring splendor. Here and there are light hay shimmers silvery in the distance. I stop in front of the formation. My comrades in arms. I can't go on. Here stands my second group, the first cantonment in Austria, will I never see them again? And the third in Prague, where are they now, when I want so much to see them around me, all of them, the survivors and the dead? There's a supernatural silence. All eyes on me. I have to say something. After we've lost so many friends, after shedding so much blood at home, and at the front an incomprehensible fate has robbed us of our victory. The courage of our soldiers, of all our people, was unparalleled, the war is lost. I thank you for the loyalty with which you, regiment, have served your country. I shake hands with all of them in turn. None of them say a word. The silent handshakes tell me they understand me. As I walk away for the last time, I hear Fridolin command. Fall in. Fall in. For the many, many of our comrades who sacrificed their young lives. Fall in, 
for our people, for their heroism, which has no equal in history. Equal, for the most beautiful legacy the dead have ever bequeathed to posterity. Now, for the countries of the West, who they have endeavored to protect, and who are now enclosed in the fatal embrace of Bolshevism, what are we to do now? Is the war over for Immelmann? Will we not give the German youth a reason to raise their heads proudly one day and make some final gesture? For example, do not dive with the whole regiment on an enemy headquarters or other important military target, and with such a death put a worthy end to the list of our combat sorties. The whole regiment will be with me as one man, I am sure of it. I put the question to the group. The answer is no. Perhaps that's right. Enough of the dead already and maybe we'll have other missions. I decide to lead a convoy heading west. It will be a very long convoy because all the formations under my command, including the anti-aircraft gunners, must follow along with the ground personnel. Everything will be ready by six o'clock and then we will hit the road. The commander of the second squadron receives orders to take to the air and with all the planes to fly west. When the Commodore learns of my intention to lead the column, he orders me, because of my wound, to fly the airplane while Fridolin leads the march. The squadron at Riekenberg remains under my command. I can no longer contact it by telephone, so I have to fly there with Neerman to inform them of the new situation. The Storch is not gaining altitude well, and I need it, because Riekenberg is on the other side of the mountains. I approach the airfield with every precaution, from the valley side. It looks kind of abandoned. I don't see anyone at first, so I pull up to the hangar with the intention of using the phone in the control room. I'm just climbing out of the storch when there is a terrible explosion and the hangar blows up before my eyes. Instinctively, we fall to the ground and wait for a hail of rocks that blow several holes in the wing, but we are not hit. Next to the control room, a truckload of rockets catches fire and they fly into the air, sparkling all the colours of the rainbow. A symbol of disaster. My heart starts to bleed just thinking about it. No one here is expecting my news that it's over. In all the likelihood, they got the news from somewhere else. We scramble into our mangled storch and after an interminably long run-up, the plane climbs exhaustedly into the air. We fly back to Kama, following along the same valley. Everyone is busy gathering. The order of departure is assigned the most favourable from the point of view of tactics. Anti-aircraft guns are spread out along the length of the column so that they can cover it in case of attack when the need arises if someone tries to stop our march. Our objective is American-occupied southern Germany. After the convoy has moved, everyone else, except those who want to wait for me to take off, will fly whoever they want. Many of them will have a chance to avoid capture if they can land somewhere near their homes. I won't be able to do that. I intend to land at an American-occupied airfield because my leg requires medical intervention, so the idea of hiding somewhere is out. Besides, there are plenty of people who might recognize me. I see no reason why I shouldn't land at a regular airfield. In the hope that Allied soldiers will treat even a defeated enemy in a chivalrous manner. The war is over, and so I'm unlikely to be arrested and detained for long, I think everyone will be allowed to go home after a short time. I am standing watching the loading of the convoy when I hear a rumbling sound high above us. It's fifty or sixty Russian bombers, Bostons. I barely have time to sound the alarm before the bombs start whistling down on us. I am lying on the road, clutching my crutches and thinking that if these guys aim well, we, with such crowding, will have huge losses. Here is already heard the rumble of explosions. The bomb carpet lies right in the centre of the city, a kilometre from the road on which our column is lined up. Poor people of Nimes. The Russians come in again. Even at the second attempt they can't get into the column. Now the cars are moving. I look one last time at my unit, which for seven years was my world and all that mattered to me. How much blood spilled for a common cause has cemented our friendship. I salute them one last time. At a T, northwest of Prague, near Kladno, the column runs into Russian tanks and a very strong military unit. Under the terms of the armistice, all weapons must be surrendered. Unarmed soldiers are guaranteed unimpeded passage.
Not much time passes after the surrender of weapons when the Czechs attack our defenseless men. Brutally, with disgusting brutality, they mercilessly kill the German soldiers. Only a few are able to make their way west, among them my young intelligence officer, Ofe. The rest fall into the hands of the Czechs and Russians. Among those who fall victim to Czech terrorism is my very best friend, Fridolin. It is an immeasurable tragedy that he had to meet such an end already after the war was over. Like their comrades who gave their lives in this war, they too become martyrs of German freedom. The convoy has moved on, and I return to the Kummer airfield. Kachner and Fridolin are still standing beside me, then they get into the car and drive off to meet their fateful fate. Six other pilots have insisted on flying west with me. We pilot three U-87s and four FV-190s. Among them is the 2nd Squadron Commander and Lieutenant Schwerblatt, who, like me, lost a leg and yet has done a tremendous job in the last week of destroying enemy tanks. He always says tanks don't care whether we destroy them with one leg or two. After a hard farewell to Fredolin and Kachner, a grim premonition tells me we will never see each other again. We take off for the last time. It's a strange and indescribable feeling. We say goodbye to our world. We decide to fly to Kitzingen because we know it is a large airfield there and therefore, as we imply, is now occupied by the American air fleet. In the neighborhood of Setz, we engage in air combat with the Russians, who suddenly appear out of the haze and hope, intoxicated with victory, to make mincemeat of us. But what they have failed to do in five years, they are failing to do today, during this final battle. We approach the airfield from the east, tensely wondering if the American anti-aircraft guns will fire on us even now. A large airfield is already visible ahead. I instruct my pilots by radio telephone that they may crash their planes on landing. We are not going to hand over still combat-ready machines into American hands. I order the landing gear to disengage and then rip them off while jogging at high speed. The best thing to do would be to brake sharply with one wheel and pedal with all my might on the same side. I see a crowd of soldiers on the airfield. They are lined up like a parade, probably some sort of victory parade, with the American flag flying above them. First we fly low over the airfield to make sure the anti-aircraft guns won't fire at us when we land. Some of the parade participants look up at us and suddenly see a German swastika above their heads. They immediately rush to the ground. We land in accordance with my orders. Only one of our planes makes a soft landing and rolls into a parking lot. The sergeant from the second squadron piloting this plane was carrying a girl in the tail of his plane and was afraid that if he landed on his belly, damage would be done not only to the plane but also to his priceless cargo. Of course, was the first time he had seen her. It just so happened that she was standing lonely on the edge of the airfield and didn't want to get to the Russians. But his comrades know better. Since I was flying first, my plane is lying on the road at the very end of the runway. Some soldier is already standing by the pilot's cockpit with a revolver pointed at me. I open the cockpit and he immediately reaches out to grab my knight's cross with gold oak leaves. I push him aside and close the booth again. Perhaps this encounter would have ended badly for me if a jeep with several officers hadn't pulled up beside me, giving this fellow a headbutt and sending him off to do his business. They came closer and saw that my bandages on my right leg were soaked in blood, the result of the air battle over Sayats. The first thing they did was to take me to the dressing station where they changed my bandages. Near man doesn't let me out of sight and follows me like a shadow. I am then taken to a large partitioned off room in an upstairs hall turned into a kind of officer's mess hall. Here I meet the rest of my comrades who have been brought directly here. They stand at attention and salute me with the salute prescribed by the Fuhrer. At the far end of the room stands a small group of American officers. They do not like this spontaneous salute and mutter something to each other. They obviously belong to the mixed fighter unit that is stationed here with their thunderbolts and mustangs. An interpreter comes up to me and asks if I speak English. He tells me that their commander objects to giving such a salute. Even if I could speak English, I reply, this is Germany here and we only speak German. As for the salute, 
We were ordered to give it that way, and being soldiers, we follow our orders. Tell your commander that we are pilots of the Immelman Regiment, and since the war is over and no one has defeated us in the air, we do not consider ourselves prisoners. The German soldier, I pointed out to him, has not been defeated in battle on equal terms, but has simply been crushed by overwhelming masses of combat equipment. We landed here because we didn't want to stay in the Soviet zone. We'd rather not discuss this any further, but wash up, clean up, and get something to eat. Some of the officers continued to scowl, but we doused ourselves so diligently with water that a whole puddle formed on the dining room floor. We are making ourselves at home here, why don't we wash up? Besides, we're in Germany. We talk without any embarrassment. Then we eat, an interpreter comes in and asks us on behalf of the commander of this unit if we could talk to him and his officers when we are done eating. This invitation interests us as pilots, and we agree, especially when a ban is placed on all mention of why and where the war was won and lost. From outside comes the sound of gunfire and noise, colored soldiers celebrating victory by getting drunk. I would not like to go downstairs to the first floor. Bullets fired for the occasion whistle here and there. We go to bed very late. Almost everything except what we had on us is stolen during the night. The most valuable thing I lose is my flight log, which describes the details of every combat sortie, from the first to 2530. Also missing is my copy of the diamonds, my diamond pilot badge certificate, my Hungarian award, and many other things, not counting watches and other things. Even my custom-made prosthetic was discovered by Nirman under some kid's bed. Maybe he wanted to carve a souvenir out of it and sell it later as a piece of high jerry. Early in the morning I received word that I was to report to the headquarters of the 9th US Air Force at Erlangen. I refused to do so until my mournful belongings were returned to me. After much persuasion, when I was told that the matter was very urgent and I could get my belongings back as soon as the thief was caught, I went with Nearman. At headquarters we were first of all questioned by three officers of the general's staff. They began by showing us some photographs which they said showed victims of atrocities in the concentration camps. They argued to us that since we had fought for this abomination, we also shared the blame for it. They refused to believe me when I told them that I had never seen a single concentration camp in my life. I added that if any excesses had been committed, they were deplorable and reprehensible, and the real perpetrators should be punished. I pointed out to them that such atrocities had been committed not only by the Germans but by all other peoples at all times. I reminded them of the Boer War. Hence, these excesses must be judged by the same criteria. I cannot believe that the piles of bodies shown in the photographs were taken in concentration camps. I told them that we had seen such pictures, not on paper but in reality, after the air attacks on Dresden, Hamburg and other cities, when four engine bombers indiscriminately literally flooded them with phosphorus and bombs of enormous destructive power, and thousands of women and children fell victim to the carnage. And I assured these gentlemen that if they were particularly interested in atrocities, they would find abundant material from their eastern allies. We were never shown these pictures again. Looking at us with anger, the officer making the interrogation report commented as I finished speaking, typical Nazi. I don't really understand why you would call someone a typical Nazi just for telling the truth. Do these gentlemen know that we fought for Germany and not for any political party? Believing this, millions of our comrades died. I said to them, the day will come and you will regret that by defeating us, you have thereby destroyed the bastion against Bolshevism. This statement of mine seemed like propaganda to them and they refused to believe me. They said we just wanted to divide the Allies and pit them against each other. A few hours later we were taken to the commander of this air army, General Weiland. The general was a German of German descent, from Bremen. He made a good impression on me and during our interview I told him about the disappearance of the already mentioned objects, so valuable to me in Kitzingen. I ask him if such incidents are frequent. He makes a fuss, but not over my frankness, but over this disgraceful theft. He orders his adjutant to instruct the commander of the unit, stationed at Kitzingen, to find my property 
and threatens the culprits with a court mark. He asks me to be his guest in Erlogen until everything is returned to me. After the conversation, Niaman and I were taken by jeep to the suburbs, where an abandoned villa was placed at our disposal. A sentry posted at the gate reminds us that we are not completely free. A car appears to take us to the officers' mess for lunch. The news of our arrival soon spreads among the inhabitants of Erlangen, and the sentry has to negotiate all the time with our many visitors. When he does not fear a sudden visit from his superiors, he tells us it's Nick's seat. This is how we spend five days in Erlangen. Our colleagues, who remained in Kitzingen, we never had occasion to see again. The Americans have no reason to detain them. May 14 at our villa appears Captain Ross, an intelligence officer of the Air Army. He speaks German well and brings us a note from General Weiland, in which he regrets that the search for my belongings has so far come to nothing. But orders have just come that we are to be taken immediately to England for interrogation. After a short stop in Wiesbaden, we are taken to a special interrogation camp near London. The lodging and food are ascetic. The English officers treat us correctly. The elderly captain to whose care we are entrusted is, in civil life, a patent lawyer from London. He visits us every day on inspection and one day sees my golden oak leaves on the table. He looks at them thoughtfully, shakes his head, and says quietly, almost fearfully, how many human lives it has cost. When I explain to him that I earned this order in Russia, he leaves with marked relief. During the day, I am frequently visited by British and American intelligence officers in varying degrees of curiosity. I soon realize that we hold opposing views. This is not surprising, given that I've made almost all combat sorties in an aircraft with low speed and my experience, therefore is quite different from that of the Allies, who tend to exaggerate the importance of every extra kilometer per hour, even if just as a guarantee of safety. There is no way they can believe that I have made more than 2,500 combat sorties in such a slow airplane. They are also not at all interested in learning from my experience, since there are no safety guarantees here. They brag about their missiles, which I already know about and which can be fired from the fastest airplane. They don't like it when I tell them that the accuracy of these missiles is much less compared to my guns. I don't particularly mind these interrogations. My successes have not been achieved with any technical secrets. Thus, our conversations are little more than a discussion about aviation and the war that has just ended. The British make no secret of their respect for the achievements of the enemy. Their attitude is built on notions of sporting integrity, and we welcome it. For 45 minutes every day, we can walk behind barbed wire. The rest of the time we read and make plans for what we will do after the war. After about two weeks, we are sent north and interned in a regular American prisoner of war camp. There are many thousands of prisoners in this camp. Food is given only the bare minimum and some of our comrades, who have been here for some time, are weakened from exhaustion. My stump is giving me trouble and I need a new operation. The camp medical chief refuses to perform the operation on the grounds that I have been flying with one leg and he is not at all interested in what is happening to my stump. It is swollen, inflamed, I suffer from acute pain. The camp authorities could not think of better propaganda among the thousands of German soldiers in favor of their former officers. Many of our guards know German well. They emigrated to the States after 1933 and speak German as well as we do. The black soldiers have a good disposition and are alert, except when they are drunk. Three weeks later I, along with Naya Man and most of the badly wounded, are transferred to Southampton. We crowd aboard the Freighter Kaiser. When 24 hours pass and no food is brought to us, we suspect this will continue all the way to Cherbourg, because the American crew is going to sell our rations on the French black market, a group of veterans of the Russian front. Learning of this, break into the pantry and take the distribution of food into their own hands. The sailors on this ship, who learn of this raid much later, have their faces pulled. The trip from Cherbourg to our new camp near Carentan is not a pleasant one, as the French civilians greet even seriously wounded soldiers with a hail of stones. 
We are not helped by memories of what a truly comfortable life the French civilians often led while in Germany. Many of them were sensible enough to welcome their lives of comfort at a time when we were holding back the Soviets in the East, and those who throw stones at us today will wake up some day. Conditions in the new camp are almost the same as in England, and here I am at first denied an operation. There's no telling when I'll be released from here, held back at least because of my rank. One day I am taken to Cherbourg Airfield, and at first it seems to me that I am being handed over to the Ivans. It will be something for the Soviets to get Field Marshals Shauna and me as a prize for a war won on the ground and in the air. The compass shows 300 degrees, so they're taking us to England again. Why? We land about 30 kilometers from the sea at Tangmere Airfield, home of the Royal Air Force Command School. Here I learn that my transfer has been secured by Major Bader is the most popular pilot in the RAF. He was shot down during the war and flew on prosthetics. He learned that I had been interned at Carrington Camp. He himself had been a POW in Germany and had made several attempts to escape. He can tell stories that are different from the fabrications of the vicious agitators who by all means try to brand us Germans as barbarians. This time spent in England has been a real rest cure after the POW camps. Here I rediscover that there is a respect for the achievements of the enemy, a chivalry that is naturally inherent in every officer in the service of any country in the world. Bader sends me to London to the man who made his prosthetics in the hope that he will make me the same. I decline this generous offer because I can't pay for the order. I've lost everything in the East, and I don't yet know what might happen in the future. In any case, I won't be able to repay him in pounds sterling. Major Bader is almost insulted when I refuse to take advantage of his kindness and worry about payment. He brings the man with him and the latter makes a plaster cast. The prosthetist returns a few days later and tells me that the stump must be bloated from the inside, as it is thicker at the end than at the base, and an operation must be performed before he can finish making the prosthesis. A few days later an inquiry comes from the Americans regarding me, because it turns out I was only loaned for a while and must be returned to my place. My vacation is almost over. During one of my last days in Tangimir, I had a much clarifying discussion with RAF cadets who were in flight school. One of them, a non-Englishman, hoping no doubt to enrage or humiliate me, asked what I think the Russians might do to me if I returned to my native places in Silesia. I suppose the Russians are smart enough, they reply, to take advantage of my experience. In the field of tank fighting, which is inevitable in any new war, my explanations may put the enemy Russians at a disadvantage. I have destroyed more than 500 tanks, and supposing that during the next few years I should train five or six hundred pilots, each of whom would destroy at least a hundred tanks. You yourself can guess how many tanks the enemy's industry would have to produce to make up for all these losses. This answer generates widespread surprise, and I am excitedly asked how this can be reconciled with my past attitude towards Bolshevism. So far I have not been allowed to say anything disparaging about Russia, there, but now I am told about the mass deportations to the East, and told about cases of rape and atrocities about the bloody terrorism with which the hordes that swooped down from the Asian steppes tortured the subjugated peoples. This is something new to me because previously they had carefully avoided touching on the subject, but now their views are exactly in line with our own, quite often expressed opinions and expressed in words that are often copied from our vocabulary. The RAF commanders who piloted hurricanes on the side of the Russians at Murmansk share their recollections, and they are extremely sharp. Of all of ours shot down, almost no one was left alive. And you want to work for the Russians, they exclaim. I was very interested to hear your opinion of your allies, I reply. Of course I have not said a word about what I think of it myself. I have only answered the question you asked. No further mention is made of Russia in my presence. I am taken back to the French camp, where I continue for some time longer. The efforts of the German doctors are finally crowned with success and I am transferred to a hospital. A few days before, Nyman is released in the British zone. He begs several times to be left with me, but it cannot be delayed any longer. A week after I leave the French camp, 
I find myself on an ambulance train to the hospital in Starnberger Sea. At Augsburg, our train is turned around and sent to Firth. Here, after a stay in a military hospital in April 1946, I managed to secure my release. 